Let's consider what the guards on swords can tell us about their probable use. Hi folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiatorius. So, what we're going to look at specifically in this video is what the guards on certain types of swords from across history. We're going to go into the ancient era, we're going to go across the world, we're going to look at what do guards tell us about the probable use of those swords. And indeed, in some cases, we definitely know about the use of the swords because we have treatises, manuals, whatever, and so we can get confirmation of our ideas. But in some cases, particularly in the ancient world, well, everything up to about 1300 really, there is a lack of evidence, uh, or rather a, 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 an insufficient amount of evidence sometimes to exactly state how a sword was used, although we can talk in general terms. But from the design of the hilt, we can often assume, um, presume certain things based on our knowledge from other sources and other swords and other periods and other areas. So it's very useful to study the development or evolution, if you want to call it that, of sword hilts as a whole, because it tells us a lot about sword use and we can apply it to areas, places, periods, where we don't necessarily have text describing how those swords were used. Now, also I want to mention in this video, we could of course talk about grips and pommels, which in a sense are kind of a more obvious way of looking at how a sword would use. On the most simplistic level, I'm holding two one-handed swords here. They are clearly not two-handed swords. Two-handed swords have two-handed length grips on them. And equally the styles of pommels, which I've talked about in various videos, do tell us things about how you cut with the sword, how you thrust with the sword, how you're supposed to hold the sword, place your hand on the hilt of that sword. And we've talked about that in the past and we'll probably talk about that again in the future but in this video we're specifically going to look at guards and what guards can tell us about how to hold how to uh, use a sword how to cut and thrust with it and even what positions what fencing positions to hold that sword in now of course using swords is a skill very skillful thing and another place you can learn or brush up on loads of new skills is Skillshare. Skillshare is the online learning community with thousands of classes, with members in over 150 countries. When you go into Skillshare, the first thing you realize is that there's hundreds and hundreds of classes which might be applicable to your job or your hobbies. Everything from animation and creative writing to film and video, fine art, graphic design, illustration, music, photography, web development, and business, management, finance, everything you can think of. If you've got a specific creative skill that you want to brush up your skills on, Skillshare is the perfect place to start or indeed if you just want to learn something completely new. If you're anything like me, your day's probably full of endless to-do lists. So why don't you prioritise your self-care and use Skillshare as a way of investing in some new skills and ways to spend your time. You can find some new ways to unwind and relax. Brand new classes being launched every single week. And the entire catalogue is available with subtitles in French, German, Spanish and Portuguese. I've been looking at the 28 Day Drawing Challenge and Anatomy for Illustration and Comics. Pretty cool stuff. I like comics, I like comic art, I'll try and brush up my skills on that and um, it's presented by Josiah or Jazza Brooks um, who's a YouTuber, artist and a really good presenter. While this course has a specific emphasis on musculature I've actually been using it as a way of improving my kind of uh, compositional and proportional drawing. So here's my special unique offer to you that only the first thousand of you though if you click that link down below you will get access for free for a month to everything on Skillshare. So whether you want to brush up on your illustration like me or check out photography or website building or anything else that interests you, just go and check out that link. Absolutely free, no ties, first thousand of you, check it out right now. So let's get back to the topic of guards on swords and what they can tell us about the use of swords. And remember, that's how to hold the sword, how to use the sword, cut and thrust and even parry with it. And additionally, the possible positions or fencing guards that you might stand in with that particular guard. And yes, we can gather information about all of those things just from the designs of the guards on the swords. At least sometimes we can. So let's put these swords down because we'll get to those in due course, but we're jumping ahead of our ourselves if we jumped in there. Let's go back, back in time to an earlier period. So I'm, for the purposes of this, I'm going to briefly talk about ancient and early medieval world swords because quite simply, up until the, uh, up, up, up until about 1000 AD, most hilts on most swords are pretty simple. They are um, a very short guard, if we call it that, and various types of grips and pommel, but we're focusing just on guards here. Now, indeed, in the ancient world, there are a few exceptions to this, and one of those is the copis or the falcata. 
And I'm going to leave that aside because I think it kind of muddies the water slightly. Generally speaking, in the ancient world, I think it's fair to say that most swords have minimal guards. And there's two ways of looking at this. First of all, we have to think about development of technology and the simple fact that uh, as we go later in time, we see more diverse types of guards developed on swords. So if we're looking in the ancient world, most swords having small guards have a small guard either because they don't feel they need a more elaborate guard, Falcatra and Copus aside, um, or simply because they haven't yet developed it and that's not something that is done on swords. So there's two ways of looking at this. But what I would say is from a technological point of view, why do most swords in the ancient world and early medieval period not meet, need much of a handguard? And that's because they were used with shields. Now just very briefly, mostly in the ancient and early medieval worlds, Shields were boss gripped. I've grabbed a Roman scutum here because it's a funny and massive example to use on screen. But if you have a boss gripped shield, it does mean that for the most part, you don't need an elaborate guard or an extended guard on your sword because you've got a big shield in front of you. And when you do attack, a lot of times, the actual sword hand is gonna be protected by the line of the shield. Not always. And certainly if we look at art of um, gladiators using their shields of various sizes and types um, with swords, we do in fact see the sword extended beyond the line of the shield sometimes. However, by and large, in a world where shields are pretty much always used with swords, and swords are not used by themselves hardly ever, unless for some reason you've lost your shield or it's broken or whatever, um, the fact is that you don't need that much of a handguard. The shield is usually blocking the line. With a right-handed person against a right-handed person, most blows and thrusts are going to be coming from the right-hand side, and you have a shield protecting that line to your hand on this side. So even if you extend the arm out, it's very likely that the opponent's weapon is going to strike or encounter the shield. Now a Roman scutum, in many ways, is a poor example, because it's usually held relatively close to the body. But any shields that, like um, Viking era and Anglo-Saxon type shields, that are held further from the body, this becomes even true because of course one hand reaches as far as the other. So if you've got a buckler or a shield that's held out extended and you're cutting with the sword, well then the lines of the hand is often protected by the shield. So without going into greater detail on that, in the ancient and early medieval world generally, Falcatis and Copus aside, and that would be an interesting topic for a future video, why do they have handguards? Because that's more interesting than why the other ones don't have handguards. Most swords, be it um, you know ancient Greek, Roman, or early medieval swords, don't have very much handguard because they don't need one. Now, as we go later into the medieval period, or as we get into around 1000 AD, of course we still have shields of various types. This is a uh, what we could call a teardrop or kite shield from the Norman era. And indeed, as we get into this era, shields are still used. However, we switch from boss gripped to predominantly um, strapped shields, like this one. So your arm is strapped to the shield. This does change some things. You can still hold the shield far from the body in some cases. However, generally speaking, not quite as far from the body. And perhaps connected to that, as we get into this era, we notice that sword guards get noticeably longer. Okay? So... There's a lot of debate about why exactly this is. One theory is that it's to stop the hand uh, smashing into an opponent's shield. So in a close melee where you've all got shields and you've all got, or most of you have got swords, a lot of you are using swords, it does provide quite a lot of protection to the hand being smashed into an opposing shield or indeed an opponent's shield being smashed into your hand, whichever way around you want to look at it. This is one theory. Another thing which is notable is the increased use of cavalry. Um, so as we get into the Norman era, it's really the birth of the knight. So as we get into the era of knights, it is possible that there is some aspect of horseback fighting, or at least their type of horseback fighting, which might be different to Japanese or Mamluk or anything else. Um, there might be something peculiar to do with their mounted combat, which meant that they needed or wanted long guards, long hand guards. Now, one aspect of this could be that if you're sitting on your horse, so you're holding the reins to the horse in your left hand with your shield here, 
It might be that what you're now doing is you're keeping the shield closer to your body than earlier styles, and you're more often extending the sword out far from the body to strike, and therefore the hand is more vulnerable in these situations, especially against other cavalry, because on a horse, naturally, you're having to reach further away and sometimes lower down if you're hitting infantry, and so it becomes advantageous to have that cross guard. And remember, in this era, at least to begin with, people didn't have any protection on their, on their hands, sometimes not even leather gloves, but they didn't have any form of gauntlet or male mitten yet. Male mittens do come along, but a you know, century or two later. So, in the 10th, 11th century, when long hand guards start to appear, it's possible there's a connection to strapped shields, and it's possible there's a connection to mounted combat. We don't really know. Uh, but what we can say, based on just looking at the evidence of the sword itself, is that for some reason they felt the need for greater hand protection, either from opponent's weapons or opponent's shields or perhaps something else, maybe even helmets. Uh, thoughts welcome below in the comments, but we can see that for some reason at this time, around 1000 AD, lots of people all over Europe decided we need more hand protection. Now the simple medieval cross guard obviously endured for centuries, okay? So they became popular, started to become popular in the 900s. They really become common by around 1000 AD, and then they endure for centuries. And in fact, even if we, I'll just shoot forward in time for a second, if we go much, much later to a 17th century rapier, for example, despite the fact that this now has a, um, a knuckle bow and a cup hilt and various other things, it fundamentally still has a long cross guard. So it still has a double-edged straight blade and a long cross guard. So that long cross guard really, really endures for a long, long time. Now, there are several things we can say about this cross guard which tell us aspects of its use. One of the first, and I consider one of the most important things, is it is in the same plane as the edge. Now, as mentioned, this could partially be because you're protecting the hand from impacting things that you are hitting. So if you're hitting in this direction, then that's the direction you want the um, guard to be pointing in. But in addition, notice it has no protection on the sides. All of the protection is in the planes of the edge. So this also tells us that when clashing with an opponent's blade, either in a defensive action or cutting into their blade or anything like this at all, the encounters, the clashes um, between these two blades are going to be between the edges of each uh, each sword, okay? Because anything sliding down here will land on the cross guard. So if this is the direction you need the um, cross guard to be pointing in, then you know that when another blade encounters it, that has to be useful in that direction. It has to be coming down in that direction. It, we know that for the most part, they are not, for example, encountering the edge on the flat because there is absolutely no protection offered to the hand in that direction. So I would argue whether you're using the sword offensively or defensively, the fact that the cross guard points in the direction of the edges actually tells us quite a lot about how these swords were used. Now another more fundamental thing that we can take from the use of these swords, and very much we see this if we, if we look at medieval fighting treatises, is there is no protection to the front of the hand here. So for example, if we again, I'll jump forward in time, if we go to any sort of sword, uh, I don't want to spoil you, so let's just grab the rapier again. If we grab any sort of sword which has a knuckle bow, we can say that there is some level of expectation that sometimes a blow will come down and hit the front of the hand because they've got protection there. Okay, So in a world where there are no gauntlets yet, but which they have thought to put a long cross guard but no protection here, we can assume that the forms of defence and encounters that we're getting between the blades through angulation, leave the hand behind the cross guard, so that the cross guard is cover covering almost like a shadow, or by, like I say, by geometry, it is covering the line to the hand. So, for example, if we look at later saber fencing, where sometimes you'll put a guard in uh, cart like this, that would leave a line open to the hand, or indeed a guard in prem open to the hand, that is unlikely or at least there's no evidence, to be a common movement with medieval swords because there is no provision for protection here other than by the geometry of the length of the crossguard. However, 
It has to be said that these cross guards are quite long and longer than you might think is necessary. And that does add to this geometric effect. So if someone swings at the side of my head and I put my sword in here in that line, you will notice that this protects the line to my hand because of the angle that their cut is coming down at. So in actual fact, you do actually get a fair amount of protection from these cross guards more than might initially appear by geometry and angulation. But that being said, they don't offer a huge amount of hand protection. They're very, very different to any kind of uh, basket hilt, for example. If we, if we grab a literal basket hilt from a later period, we'll get to this in due course, um, then indeed we have to remember that with these medieval swords you have minimal hand protection. You've got some, but minimal. And that dictates the guard positions that the sword is held in. Okay, so with or without a shield, very often the hand is held back either high or low, sometimes under the shield or buckler, sometimes over the uh, shield arm or buckler arm, um, and uh, sometimes held back here, ready to strike, sometimes held here, ready to strike, sometimes point forward, but with the hand back. So the fact that you've got so little hand protection very often dictates where you hold the sword in fencing or combat. For example, we don't generally stand forward in a sabre guard with a medieval arming sword because the hand is too vulnerable. If we had a basket hilt, entirely different situation, you now can stand with the hand presented forward because you've got a whole load of protection around the hand. You don't have that with a medieval arming sword and so you don't normally stand in these positions, uh, certainly not without a shield to protect the sword hand. So coming forward a few centuries, as mentioned, the cross guard stays in use well into the uh, 16th century in common usage and with additional guards on it very common still in the 17th century. Okay, so right the way through the medieval period from about 1000 AD, 1100, 1200, 1300, 1400, the cross guard is still by itself the still basic form of handguard on long swords, arming swords, all types of swords, okay? And it's only really around 1400 that we start to see additional things start to be added to the guard, which we'll look at in a second. But one adaptation I want to briefly mention is the curving up of the guard. Now this is actually something which appears quite early on, but isn't very common. It generally speaking becomes more common as we get into the 13th, 14th century. And one possible reason and one likely reason for that is that it is a way of controlling the opponent's blade. So something I didn't mention is that when you start to come from the period where massive shields start to become smaller, there does seem, and we start to get into what I might call the sword and buckler age, um, so the 13th century really, it does seem that there's probably, and this is conjecture, but there's probably a greater amount of edge uh, of blade on blade contact okay binding so those those of us who fence we only have treatises technical treatises from about the year 1300 AD onwards however in all of those treatises even from the earliest one which is known as I33 or 133 or the Tau effect book which is a sword and buckler source from southern Germany that's stored in the Royal Armouries in the UK um, even in that source, there is a huge amount of blade on blade contact. Okay, so already by 1300 AD, that seems to be common. Now, if we've got lots of blades, I'll just grab a stick for the purposes of this, because these are uh, sharp swords and I don't want to um, damage them against each other. Um, but if you've got lots of blade on blade contact, what will often happen is this. Or indeed, if that's the opponent's blade here, you might want to wind into their blade and thrust them in the face or the body. Okay, now if we've got encounters where these two blades are coming against each other, then as you will clearly see, it becomes advantageous to have cross guards where things can get stuck. Now, not all cross guards are curved, uh, many of them were still straight, but some cross guards that were straight had little turned up ends, again for detaining. So, I think it's worth mentioning that because that clearly demonstrates that the cross guard, rather than just being something to protect the hand from things sliding down or direct strikes at the hand, now additionally also has a degree of trapping uh, built into it. So sometimes there are techniques like, for example, the um, uh, Winden into, into Ox in this case, where the cross guard plays a very active part in the technique. So encountering the opponent's blade, winding, binding and winding and thrusting in the face with their blade essentially resting against your cross guard and being trapped by it. So that starts to become an important feature in guards and tells us a lot about fencing of the time. 
And as mentioned, here's an example of a fairly straight guard with turned up ends. This is a replica of a sword dating to about 1430. And so that's a similar feature. It's to do with trapping and prevent things popping off and uh, coming down and hitting either parts of your hand or your wrist or back of the hand or things like this. So it's about controlling the opponent's blade. Now, around the year 1400, in fact, the earliest example, I think, is 1396 in art, but the earliest surviving examples we have are from about 1410, 1420, we start to get another thing very occasionally, and particularly on Italian swords, this. The fingering. Now I've spoken a lot about fingerings in other videos, so I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail, but this is to do with control of the sword and of course protecting the finger when you're exerting that control on the sword. So something we start to see in art already in the 13th century, there might even be 12th century examples you can find, but certainly by the 13th century, you start to see people start to loop the finger over the guard. And this is, without going into huge detail, to give more control to the point of the blade and also certain types of cut if you're cutting from the wrist. Moulinet, essentially. Okay, and we know this from Bolognese treatises from the 16th century. Now, if you're doing that, and people had been doing this for maybe about a hundred years, if in certain circles, particularly sword and buckler fencing, so the, the earliest systemized fencing systems, which are the birth of everything that came later, like rapier and small sword and everything else, if you're commonly looping your finger over the guard, then clearly it's only a matter of time before someone says, well, let's stick something on there to protect the finger. Because clearly if a blade slides down, as I've just demonstrated before, um, would normally come down onto the guard. If you've got a finger over there, it'll chop your finger off or at least really, really hurt. Um, and those of us who fence with uh, fingering si systems, if you've ever been hit on the index finger, it hurts a lot, okay, even with a blunt sword and even with uh, hand protection on. So, these finger rings clearly were added for extra uh, protection for the finger when you had the finger over the guard for extra control. Now, it's important to mention, of course, that tells us a huge amount about how these swords are being used and held and all of this kind of stuff. Um, and that is the birth of the paired finger rings that you get on both sides that ultimately lead to the swept hilt side sword hilts, rapier hilts, and these are around for a good, uh, well, about three centuries, um, and they are very common. Now, not only do you sometimes put one finger over, and it wasn't compulsory, it was user preference, but you could sometimes put two fingers over, and even there were other options that you could do as well, okay? And sometimes, uh, I was talking to someone last night, there's another system where the finger goes, oh, I can't even remember, but there's various options. That's Tebow I was referring to, which I've never studied, but anyway, they were telling me about it. Um, so the simple fact is that these finger rings give you options for controlling mostly the point, but also certain types of cut as well. They give you extra control over the um, weapon, and they hugely relate to the fencing systems that are in use at the time. Now, before we get into rapiers, um, we're going to just rewind a bit because there is another very important star of medieval hand protection uh, or, or hilt adaptation that is very important to acknowledge, and that is the nagel, okay, which means German for nail. So we can call it the nail. So the nail, uh, which projects out of the side of the guard. Now. That's a super interesting thing, and it has potential parallels in other parts of the world, if we just shoot over to China for a second. So, famously in Asia, um, many hand guards, particularly in China, Japan, and Korea, uh, and places like uh, Southeast Asia as well, have a form of disc guard. Now, I'm gonna put the messer down for a second. Um, because I think that these are related things. What does the disc guard tell us? Well, if we just take everything we've just talked about medieval swords, what it does initially tell us is we don't have long projecting quillons. There are Chinese swords which do have projecting quillons. So there's certain types of jian, that's the straight double-edged sword, and even there's certain types of dao, the single-edged sword, which do have projecting quillons, very much like a medieval sword. And the assumption there is it's for the same reasons as medieval swords. But what's interesting is about 900 or 1000 AD, in, uh, it seems to be in Japan first, interestingly, we start to see forms of disc guard. So what does that tell us? I don't really know, and we don't even really know where the discards come from. They, they sort of appear in Japan out of nowhere, 
uh, and then they get popular in China about 100 years later, as far as I've seen. It seems like um, it, whether they were an internal Japanese invention, whether they came from the mainland, we don't really know. But nevertheless, disc guards completely uh, predominate, certainly on single-edged swords, it, obviously things like the um, the Tachi and the uh, then the Katana in Japan, and things like the Dao in China, they completely predominate. Why? We don't really know. However, it is notable that they don't have frontal hand protection much at all, they don't have projecting quillons, which suggests maybe they're not binding on the blades as much as European swords are, but they do have side protection. What might this tell us? Well, it might tell us that there are action, there are probably less binding actions in uh, Chinese and Japanese martial arts, in the early days at least, and possibly it tells us that when there are interactions between the blade, that they're often between the opponent's edge and your flat. Now, why would it tell us that? Well, we come back to the medieval Mesa for a second. Mesa, incidentally, just means knife, much in the same way that Dao does. <laughs> it means, so, we won't get into the etymology here, but what we do know is that Mesa often have a side guard in addition to the in the direction of the edge guards. Now what we have wonderfully is Mesa treatises that show us techniques and in those we see that sometimes there is a defense put in with the flat of the blade against the edge. And this is not common. This isn't mainstream. Most defences with the Mesa are if a cut's coming down, you cut into the cut, either the person's weapon or hand or arm or head. Um, so you respond with a cut into a cut that covers the line at the same time. Or you defend with the edge in whatever way. You parry with the edge that way, that way, that way, whatever way you want to parry. So parries with the edge or counter cuts just the same as in all European system, are the mainstay and the most predominant thing. But sometimes in Mesa sources, we see a parry done with the flat of the blade against the incoming edge, and usually followed up by a, a wind and a thrust. And this is reliant on having a nagel. If you don't have a nagel, what happens? You get cut on the side of the hand. So to me, that's kind of confirmation of a lot of things we say about simple cross-hilted swords, that they're defending predominantly with the edge, because if you defended with the flat, well then you'd expect them to have a side ring or a nagel, like a, like a Mesa does. We know Mesa do that, and they have a nagel. So those two things go hand in hand. Now, if we take this back to certain types of Asian sword which have discards, possibly therefore it's a similar thing. Possibly they are doing defences with the flat of the blade, historically, and therefore they need the guard to project as much on the side as it does on the front. Now, coming back to European swords, there's another thing that you will notice quite prominently on this sword, as in addition to the nagel, and that is the knuckle bow. Now, much like the finger ring and the side nagel and the side ring, these are things which start to come about, will start to gradually become more common as the 15th century progresses. Now this is almost certainly connected to the fact that in the 15th century there was a rising class of pro professional, likely equipped soldiers. So whether it's English longbowmen, whether it's uh, Genoese crossbowmen, whether it's um, various city-states in Italy um, or different uh, burghers, towns in uh, you know Germany, Austria, Switzerland, the Cantons, um, the Hussites, all of these people, who are starting to, you start to see the rise of mercenaries, professional mercenary soldiers, but also the rise of more professionally equipped and trained militias and retinue soldiers, okay? And all of these types of soldiers, one thing that they had in common is a lot of them didn't have much hand protection. In many cases, didn't have much armor. But they're having to fight against knights in full armor and all this kind of stuff. Um, and they're having to fight each other, of course, huge numbers of them. So with the rise of this type of soldier, whether it's Swiss pikemen or, or whoever else, you start to see swords being created, especially for these types of soldiers to provide better hand protection. The medieval knight by this point, wielding a sword like this at the exact same time, didn't necessarily need that because they're wearing gauntlets, they're wearing plate gauntlets by this point. So they're wearing steel all over their hands. But someone, for example, who's a uh, French crossbowman, perhaps wielding a sword like this or a, a German halberdier, this is their sidearm that sits at their side. They don't necessarily have gauntlets, 
they can't afford gauntlets or gauntlets don't work with the job they have to do like loading and shooting a crossbow and so they don't wear gauntlets they need a sword that provides a bit more hand protection and in this case what does this hilt tell us well it tells us that they almost certainly don't have gauntlets because you can't fit gauntlets in this kind of hilt very easily in many cases but it also tells us practical things about how this sword was used because it's got a nagel at the side which means that at least some of the time it's probably being used in actions where the flat of the blade with the thumb on the underneath is being pushed against the opponent's blade to bind so you need the side guard as well as the frontal and rear guards but additionally it's got a knuckle bow which means that without hand protection you can start in instead of only having these quite wide spaced guards with a simple cross guard or no guard at all you can start to have guards which are a little bit more frontal because you've got a bit more hand protection in front of the hand. And this is a trend that we see as we go into the 16th century, as hand guards start to get more complex, more complete. Not always, there are still simple hilted swords, but at least where the swords have more hand protection, we start to see the fencing systems adapt to accommodate that. And these, it's like a chicken and egg thing, which came first, we don't know, but they go hand in hand. Now, having just talked about Mesa and having talked about um, Asian swords which have projecting guards at the sides and my possible theories about those there is a type of sword which is really quite odd and which sort of sits outside of the main evolution of European swords and a great example of that is the Katzbalger. Now, I will be doing a dedicated video just about the Katzbalger soon, but you will notice that the Katzbalger has, uh, not all of them, but most of them, have this very characteristic double ring style guard. Now, you'll also notice the Katzbalger does not have projecting guards, not most of them anyway, some of them do, some of them the S is a bigger and they actually project more out here, that's probably from earlier uh, uh, Skivona, um, so um, swords from the Balkans essentially, but these double ring types, they essentially project pretty much more at the side than they do at the front and back. What's that all about? Um, so we talked all about medieval swords and how they predominantly project front and back in the planes of the edge, okay? That's an arming sword. That's what arming, we know how arming swords work. That's what they do. Then we've looked at the Messer and we've gone, well, a Messer does like an arming sword, but it has an additional nargle at the side because we know it does some actions with the flat of the blade uh, in binding and winding. And then we've looked at the, we've looked at Asian swords which have disc guards and possibly that's related to the Messer. So what the hell's going on with, with the Katzbalga? Well, I guess it's possible and this is only a theory, it's possible if we just look on the other evidence we've got, the Katzbalga has a guard that projects at the sides and only a little bit in the planes of the edge. In fact, almost as little in the planes of the edge as a Viking era sword. Look at that. It's only got as much front and back protection as the, as the Viking era sword. So, was this used with shields? No, not really. This was a sidearm for people whose primary weapons were usually guns, pikes, halberds, or a massive two-handed sword like that. So if their primary weapons mean that they can't really carry shields, there were some that carried shields, I have to say, and there are some pictures of Lance Connects carrying shields. But predominantly, if Lance Connects were carrying these as a backup weapon and they weren't carrying shields, this is supposed to be used by itself. So does that possibly mean that they are not binding or encountering or parrying the opponent's blade with their edge and they're actually doing everything with the flat of the blade. It's possible. Um, I don't know. We don't, we don't have any treatises for these things. They are a very different beast. Why did they not have projecting front, uh, front and rear cross guards? We don't know. Um, theories are welcome below. I'd be interested to see what you think about it, but at the moment, based on the evidence we've got, I can only say that could be evidence for the fact that they are always encountering an opponent's blade with the flat of their blade, possibly. Or it could be completely out of, uh, in a completely left field, it could be simply that they didn't want long cross guards that might tangle up with their fancy clothing. Possibly because of all of their slash and puff clothing, they didn't want a cross guard that would get stuck in there. And this guard is not gonna get stuck in everything because it's a bit like a giant disc. And it still provides enough hand protection for when you're basically at punching and wrestling range. So you can still use this sword really deftly and nimbly in close, and it's difficult to get caught up in anything or blocked by anything. I don't know. 
theories welcome below. So at this point, allow me to do an unusual thing for this channel, and that is to have an interlude. This was the end of part one. This video turned out to be way more in depth and way longer than I'd originally intended, so it works better as two videos. I hope you've enjoyed part one, and I also hope, of course, that you'll join us for part two, where I'll be looking at the 16th century onwards. So, Give us a like and uh, subscribe if you haven't done already, and hopefully I will see you back here for part two.